When a cop is invited to a wedding, she's astounded when she discovered that the bride is turning 18 on the same day. The officer notices something even more disturbing and quickly stops the pastor from performing the rites because of a shocking reason. St. Mary's Church in the heart of Richmond had an unassuming brick facade, but the inside was filled with floral scents and wedding decorations. Kaylee was celebrating her 18th birthday, and she was also getting married. There was a soft murmur among the gathering, but more about curiosity than celebration. Pastor Michael's presence commanded attention as he looked over the people in the pews. There were a sparse mix of townsfolk and distant relatives. Many of them were there out of pure curiosity, and not to share the joy of the event. In the pews was Laura Hart. She was a guest, but also a detective. She was somebody's plus one, but immediately felt herself drawn to the bride. The groom was an altar boy, and his demeanor spoke volumes of his unwavering faith. But his future wife was hiding something. Kaylee stood at the altar in a simple white dress, but she couldn't resemble a blushing bride at all. Instead, she looked like a trapped bird. Her smile was forced, and her movements were hesitant. But it was the look in her eyes that most concerned Laura. It was pleading, as if she was hoping against hope for somebody to come to her rescue. Laura knew to trust her instincts. They'd been honed by years on the force, so she paid attention to her surroundings. Kaylee's interactions with Pastor Michael seemed choreographed, but this wasn't the kind of choreography that came from a wedding rehearsal. This was different. It seemed to Laura that every move Kaylee made, each word she said, and even her facial expressions had been drilled into her, like a soldier on parade. And God forbid she made a mistake. If that happened, there would be consequences. The ceremony followed the usual liturgy. When it came to the vows, Pastor Michael Stone changed. Laura noticed this too. Her mind was now working and processing in top gear. The pastor's words suddenly sounded like commands. And when Kaylee answered, her words were barely audible. The level of desperation with this girl was something only a person with Laura's trained powers of observation could detect. The congregation started to mingle as soon as the ceremony was over. Laura's concern deepened once again. She approached Kaylee to offer congratulations, but there was more to it. She wanted to get closer to the bride, to have a proper look. And that was the moment she noticed it. There was a faint bruise around Kaylee's wrist. Laura had seen this many times before, mostly when she investigated domestic troubles. Someone had grabbed Kaylee by the wrist and then jerked her around. Being the cop she was, the sight of the bruise fueled Laura's determination. Something was wrong here. She didn't know what it was yet, but she was going to find out. These thoughts rambled through her mind as she walked into the reception. Laura remained more vigilant than ever. The guests chatted and the atmosphere was lighthearted. A stark contrast to the bride's behavior before the altar, Laura thought. Kaylee navigated the room while the cop watched. Like before the altar with Pastor Michael, each interaction with a guest was painfully rehearsed. It was as if Kaylee had a list of things she was allowed to say and the list of things she wasn't. The proof was in her forced smiles and the way her eyes darted around. The moment the bride stepped away for a quick breath, Laura cornered her in a quiet corner. Her presence startled Kaylee. I hope you find happiness, Kaylee, Laura said. Kaylee thanked her, and again it sounded like a rehearsed thank you. Then her eyes met the cops, but only for a split second. Kaylee reached out to adjust a vase on the table. Her sleeve pulled back, and Laura got a closer look at the bruise on her wrist. If there's anything you need, or if you're in any kind of trouble, you can trust me, Laura said. Kaylee gave the detective a look of fear. She pulled her sleeve down to cover the bruise and assured Laura she was fine. Then she hurriedly excused herself and disappeared into the crowd. Laura knew she couldn't let this go. Kaylee's bruise, the girl's discomfort, and the really strange dynamics made this way too compelling to ignore. She stepped outside, found a spot around the corner of the church, and made a discreet phone call. This wasn't her first rodeo. She knew exactly who to contact. Within an hour, she had initiated an official inquiry into the marriage. The detective cited suspicion of coercion and possible duress as her reasons for the request, and underlined it by emphasizing her credentials concerning these matters. This meant the legal recognition of the marriage was on ice pending further investigation. It was a start. 
She had no doubt her bold move could draw backlash, but she was prepared. Her priority was Kaylee's well-being and safety. Laura was willing to face all the consequences to ensure it. The reception continued, but Laura's mind was already working on a strategy. And after the wedding, she wasted no time. She dove headfirst into her investigation. The marriage license listed Pastor Michael as Kaylee's guardian. He had been her legal tutor from when Kaylee was 16. Laura slid down the bureaucratic rabbit hole and buckled down with public records and legal writs. Kaylee's parents had died in an automobile accident. The circumstances were suspicious, but uninvestigated. Kaylee was legally an orphan, and this is when Pastor Michael stepped in and assumed guardianship. Then Laura was off to the local courthouse. She wanted to know how Pastor Michael's guardianship came about. The file was thin. The judge approved the guardianship based on Pastor Michael's standing in the community. All that was needed was a sworn statement by the clergyman that he would provide for Kaylee. Usually there would be follow-up reports and welfare check reports in such a file, but in this case there was none. Given the circumstances, this wasn't only unusual, it was downright odd. Next up, Laura started the interview phase of her investigation. This meant immersing herself in the community. Every person she spoke with regarded Pastor Michael as a benevolent caretaker. But Laura noticed a pattern in the stories. Whenever they spoke about Kaylee, there was a similar distant pity in their eyes. But nobody could provide any details about her life before the accident or even before she moved into Pastor Michael's home, so nobody knew if and how she adjusted to her new life. Here too, just like at the wedding, Laura noticed that much of the truth remained hidden. Red flags went up. The community's vague and similar praises for Pastor Michael and the complete absence of any information about Kaylee before her parents' death were at the core of her tingling spidey sense. Then it was teachers and classmates. Kaylee's performance at school took a nosedive after her parents' death. The teachers told her she became quiet and that Pastor Michael insisted on being the only contact for everything the school wanted to communicate. He even forbade the school to allow Kaylee to see a counselor. They were all concerned that the poor girl had no independence. This was unnatural for a teenager her age. The picture Laura's investigation was piecing together was disconcerting, to say the least. While there were no overt signs of maltreatment, it was evident Pastor Michael exercised complete control over Kaylee's life. She was isolated from her peers, and every interaction was managed. Kaylee was under his thumb in every way. Laura knew this was more than a simple story of guardianship and everybody seemed to be in on it. The community had fed her a carefully crafted narrative, and what she had sensed from Kaylee at the wedding convinced her there was a more sinister dynamic at play. Then Laura got a phone call that turned out to be a game changer. Criminal accusations had been leveled at Pastor Michael and the church almost a year before. In the process, the church's financial records became a part of the public domain. Once Laura had those in her hands, she realized she was uncovering something way more complete than she had initially suspected. She used their contacts at the financial crimes unit, and they helped her spot a pattern of irregular withdrawals and deposits. None of these aligned with the charitable activities the church had assigned them to. There were several large transfers too, and these were unexplained. These transfers pointed to a whole network of accounts around Pastor Michael's church, and all of them had dubious origins. The suspicious accounts led Laura to a tangled web of shell companies funded by anonymous donors. The complexity of the transactions and the speed at which money was deposited into and then transferred from the accounts suggested a highly efficient money laundering outfit. Added to that, when Laura followed the money, she established clear links between Pastor Michael and an organized network of fraudsters and smugglers. This was all significant. Laura now looked at Pastor Michael as her prime suspect. Her next step was the most difficult. She wanted to approach Kaylee. They met in a coffee shop, and from the outset it was clear that the girl had no idea what she was talking about. She was completely oblivious to the pastor's extramural activities. If anything, Kaylee was an unwitting pawn in something Father Michael needed her for. But what? Laura requested federal help, and when she presented the evidence, agencies came swarming. The collaboration broadened the scope of her investigation and gave her access to resources she would never have if she continued going it alone. That said, Laura knew full well that this battle would be fraught with risks. 
bringing Pastor Michael to book was not going to be easy. He was cocooned in a web of deniability, but Laura was determined. Her priority remained Kaylee, but this was bigger now. When the investigation moved into its final stages, Laura brought Kaylee into the station under the pretense of looking at some paperwork. I've uncovered something worrying, Laura said once the girl was settled. It's about Pastor Michael and his activities beyond the church. I believe you're in a position you never intended to be in, and you must understand you're not alone. Kaylee's reaction was unexpected. Relief flooded her eyes. For once, they held Laura's and didn't dart away immediately. She told Laura through her sobs that she had wanted to leave so badly, and also that Pastor Michael had something on her, something that could destroy her life if it ever came out. Laura leaned forward. She was angry now. She hated bullies, and clearly Pastor Michael was one. Whatever it is, Kaylee, we can work through it, she said. You have my word that you're safe here, and nothing you say will be used against you. We must bring Pastor Michael to justice, and your testimony could be the key. Silence hung heavy between them. Then Kaylee's shoulders relaxed. She drew a deep breath and began to tell a story that shocked Laura. Pastor Michael had discovered a secret from her past. It was not the kind of secret that could only ruin her reputation. If it got out, it had put her in mortal danger. Kaylee didn't divulge specifics, but whatever it was, her secret was enough to keep her tethered to Pastor Michael. She added that Pastor Michael had threatened to reveal it if she ever tried to leave or speak against him. Laura held her by the shoulders. Kaylee, you've taken the hardest step by talking to me today, she said. We'll handle Pastor Michael together, and I'll do everything in my power to protect you and your secret. Trust me, he won't be able to hurt you anymore. Kaylee didn't speak for a while. She seemed to understand the gravity of what was happening. If all went well, it would be the closure of a horrible chapter in her life and possibly the beginning of something better. Then she told Laura it wasn't only a secret, it was her whole identity. She said her name wasn't even really Kaylee. She paused, perhaps to gauge Laura's reaction before she continued. Then came the crux of the story. Her parents were both high-profile prosecutors. They were working on a case to expose the links between the New York mob and organized crime in Las Vegas. Things went wrong, information leaked that shouldn't have, and then the accident happened and they were dead. She was placed in witness protection immediately, but she couldn't cope and ran away. This was how she ended up with Pastor Michael. Things fell into place for Laura now. Taking control of the young orphan's life allowed the crooked pastor to use her identity. Now that she was 18, it was important to keep her in line, and using her past was the easiest way to do it. This is why he had forced her to marry an unassuming boy who worked for him. The revelation was a bombshell. It ripped the lid of the case and provided Laura with almost everything she needed to take it to a prosecutor. She leveraged every resource at her disposal and broadened the investigation to include the federal witness protection angle. Laura's team tirelessly traced the intricate web of financial fraud and picked up signals that Pastor Michael had indeed used Kaylee's identity on some of the documents for his illicit transactions, and it was all to disguise and obfuscate. Communication proved to be the final nail in Pastor Michael's proverbial coffin. A meticulous review of his cell phone records revealed various encrypted messages with someone senior in the witness protection program. Laura was dumbfounded. This was one of their own. She dug deeper and found that there was some kind of quid pro quo arrangement in place. Pastor Michael offered financial incentives in exchanging for highly classified information, and he got it. Finally, Laura believed she had enough to effect an arrest. Again, she made it a multi-agency operation. Once in custody, the charges were extensive. They included fraud and money laundering, identity theft, the egregious manipulation of Kaylee and her finances, and a whole host of lesser charges. At the same time, the corrupt official was apprehended. Laura let his own people make the arrest. Kaylee's testimony was pivotal in Pastor Michael's conviction, but he refused to go down easy. He tried to make deals and offered information he said prosecutors missed, and each time Kaylee filled in the blanks and the deal became dead in the water. It was clear Pastor Michael was going to spend decades behind bars. When she took the stand, Laura hardly recognized Kaylee. She was a pillar of strength. Her quiet, shy demeanor was gone. Instead, on the stand was a strong young woman who had seen the worst the world has to offer and was taking a stance to try to make it better, or at the very least, fairer.
The community reeled from the revelations in the court case. The depth of the corruption and Pastor Michael's betrayal shocked them to the core, but at the same time, there was a sense of closure and hope. Oversight and accountability became buzzwords in conversations around town. Kaylee and Laura watched from an office in the court building as the judge read out the jury's findings. Pastor Michael was found guilty on all charges, and the verdict was repeated for all his co-defendants. In the end, it had taken a brave young girl to step forward and bring down a criminal cartel of gargantuan proportions. In her own way, this was also justice for her parents. Organized crime was a scourge that stole lives and destroyed futures. Kaylee knew that better than anyone else, and now she had played her part in bringing down a few key players at least. Kaylee's journey from victim to advocate was a profound transformation. She displayed qualities that resonated deeply with Laura and everyone who came to know her story, and it set the stage for the rest of her life. What a shocking story. What would you do if someone threatened you with events from your past to prevent you from reporting their crimes? Tell us in the comments. We love interesting conversations like this. For now though, we're out of here. Catch you in the next video.